Father, we thank you for every good and perfect gift. Lord, thank you for the air that we breathe. Thank you for putting, giving us life and putting us here this morning. Help us, Lord, to be more and more like your son, Jesus. For it's in the matchless, powerful, precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. As we as Christians are scrambling to better understand sexuality and sexual identity, and we're looking at how the world has sort of just, just taken over the conversation in our absence, in the absence of um, Christians who decide, well, we're not going to say anything about it. Why are we saying anything about it? That creates a vacuum. And in the silence, in that vacuum, well, what is fill, filling that vacuum? Lies. The lies of the world. And so we would, shouldn't be surprised when our children uh, are so confused because we've been silent. But now I find the church, we're awakening a little bit and saying, oh my goodness, where in the world is this coming from? People now that says, I can be a woman and I can now compete. And praise the Lord that the Swimming Federation is now saying that men can't compete as women. Anyone happy about that? I am. That's the insanity that we're talking about. And, and I think the reason we need to take some of that blame because we've been silent. In that absence, in that vacuum, it's been filled with lies. But as we're scrambling to understand sexual identity being full of grace and full of truth and looking for ways to not combat it, but actually hope to win the lost, I see this issue of sexuality as almost a tro Trojan horse that is brought into the city transgenderism. You guys know the story about Troy and the Trojan horse that um, the, the, the city they thought they won and they thought there was this Trojan, a, a wooden horse that was out there that was the, the kind of the, uh, the prize that they won. And they, what did they do? They brought it in the city. And then at night, what happened? The enemy came out of the horse and ransacked the city. So I feel like sexuality is the Trojan horse that brought into the city transgenderism. How do we respond to transgenderism? Not agreeing with the insanity, but how do we respond that's full of grace and full of truth? For example, questions like, is sex, male and female, is it a social construct? Is it a matter of personal choice? Are there more than two genders? You see, 10 years ago, questions like this were unheard of, unless you were in a secular school in the English department or the women's studies department. But as peculiar and even sacrilegious as questions like that may seem, they're actually commonplace today, not only among the world, but even among Christians. Maybe your kindergartner has a playmate who's being raised gender neutral. Or maybe your coffee shop, instead of having name tags, they have pronoun tags. Because it doesn't matter what your name is, what matters is what pronouns you're using. Or maybe it hits a little bit closer to home. Maybe you have a family member who's transitioning. Although, mo although the modern West here has lost its boundaries, and, and, and I also want to be clear, Yes, this is Huntsville, but don't think that just because you're in Huntsville, you're immune. If our kids have a computer or have this rectangular thing, these smart devices, which I, I think that's an oxy, I mean, it doesn't make you smarter in many cases. <laughs> Unless our kids are locked in a room, which wouldn't that be nice if we could do that? put them up in a tower, you know, Rapunzel, Rapunzel. That would be nice, but that's not the reality. Because even if we could do that, guess what they're dealing with? They're sinful hearts. 
But the modern West and the world that's seeping into the church, though it might celebrate the plethora of all these gender options, how do we Christians respond in light of the good news of Jesus Christ? Because I think before we try to do right, we need to think right. I think this younger generation, almost in every generation, the younger generation always has a passion to do right, to do something, do right. But the problem is if you try to do right without thinking right, you could end up doing wrong. We would call this in theology making sure that your orthodoxy precedes your orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is right doctrine. That not, must precede your right doing. So how do we think right about these issues? Well, we need to recognize these four categories of sex, gender, norms, and roles. Sex, gender, norms, and roles. And, and these categories, especially sex and gender, used to mean the same thing. Now it's become that it means something different. So when the world is using these terms, I think we need to know what the world is talking about so that we can actually be able to engage them well and not just be like the ostriches with our heads in the sand. Need to engage with these concepts. Some of these are false concepts, but still concepts that the world uses. So let's begin with the first category of sex. This is a legitimate category. The term sex... Um, has a couple definitions, uh, before I get to this definition. A um, couple definitions. Sex can mean the act of sex. Sexual intimacy. But sex can also have a different definition, which is the category of male or female. That's different, right? Sex, the act, sexual intimacy, is different than sex, male or female. Sex as an act, that's what I was addressing in my last talk, this talk, I'm going to be using sex as male or female. So with that, sex is an objective binary classification. In this sense, it refers to divisions based on sexual reproductive functions. These are actually quantifiable differences between the sexes, male and female. Sex is male or female is biological, genetic, anatomical, physiological, neurological, hormonal, and many more. And, and in no way do I mean to be offensive, but men and women are different. <laughs> amen. I heard one amen. Can we all say amen? <laughs> amen. Isn't it weird and strange that to say that today is offensive. To say that men and women are different. A fact. Like, we're not, like, this is not subjective. It's a fact. And, and yet, that's viewed to be offensive. And yet, many today claim that sex, male or female, it's not objective. It's arbitrary. As if it's assigned at birth. A doctor just randomly kind of, you know, like pin the tail on a donkey. Have you guys remember that? It's, it's, it's like that. that. That's what doctors do. You know, I don't know. Mm, boy. That's what the world, that's what assigned at birth essentially means. It's a, just a random just guessing. But I want to be as clear as I can be clear Sex is not assigned at birth. It's observed. It's observed objectively by looking at a baby's anatomy. And it can be confirmed genetically through a blood test, a DNA test. When people claim that sex is assigned at birth, you could just ask them a really simple question. Have you ever had a pet before? A dog or a cat? Do we have to ask a dog its feelings to find out whether it's a boy or a girl? Or do we just flip it on its back, <laughs> lift up its tail? A two-year-old can do that. And yet, where are we at today? 
A Supreme Court justice cannot even answer that question, what is a woman? That's where we are today. And though it might not be the public schools here in Huntsville, but I would say give it a few more years, I bet many of the public school teachers today will not be able to answer that question, what is a woman? Actually, I don't even think that's the real problem. I think the real problem is today we, don't even, we can't even answer what is a human. So sex is not assigned at birth. It's simply observed. So are we then, and, and also, so it's, so it's objective, meaning it's not subjective. It's not based on what I feel or what I think. It's binary. What does binary mean? It means there's two categories, male or female. We, so sex is male or female. Then does that mean we are sexual beings? And I put the sexual in, in quotes. Now, as Christians, when we use that term sexual, we would refer to male or female. But the issue is sexual kind of has takes on a new meaning today, especially in our hypersexualized world. What does sexual, what connotation does that give? Especially when we say sexual beings. It gives the impression that we can't live without sex as sexual beings. Is that true? I mean, no one believes that. Well, there's someone named Sigmund Freud. And I don't want to pick on him, but I am. Sigmund Freud asserted that abstaining from sex would lead to pathosis. Like, it leads to mental health issues. Alfred Kinsey, who was even worse than Freud, and I don't know if you've ever read any of their biographies. Alfred Kinsey was from Indiana University, the sexologist. They even, even today, they have an institute named after him. There's only one word that best describes both of those men, pedophiles. They're pedophiles. They studied infants and studied how they get aroused. If that's not a pedophile, I don't know what is. That's what they, but they did it under the name of science. Alfred Kinsey, he further purport, I mean, just to let you know what Kinsey did, he studied like six-month-old babies at how they got aroused. And they have an institute named after him at Indiana University. That's where we are. And this was decades ago, and they still have that institute. Alfred Kinsey went further and purported that a person can become neurotic due to sex. I've been without sex for over 20 years, and I'm on the brink of becoming neurotic, I guess. <laughs> it's even in politics. U.S. Representative from California, and I know you're like, well, pff, that explains it. <laughs> Her name is Barbara Lee. She stated this. You've got to listen to this carefully. An abstinence until marriage program is not only irresponsible, it's inhumane. So are we sexual? Well, it depends on how we define sexual. Is it like, I got to have sex? You know, and I know people, when they say sexual, they, they're thinking male or female, but does it give a wrong connotation? See, words matter. I, I think we need to be careful with our words, and words also can change t meaning over time. And if it gives more of this connotation that we have to have sex as opposed to we're male or female, maybe thinking about using a different word. So honestly, instead of saying that we're sexual beings, I, I actually prefer to say that we are sexed beings differentiating that between the act of sex and the fact that we are just male or female. So sex, sex is an objective binary classification of being male or female. But right away when people, you know, binary, well, male or female, well, aren't there others? What about intersex? 
I hear this a lot. What about intersex? And then they try to use intersex to justify transgenderism. How many of you guys have heard that argument before? What about intersex? You know, people are kind of in between, right? Well, let me first explain what is intersex. Intersex is an exceptionally rare condition. By all counts, one in thousands, not one in hundreds. And does that then prove intersex, uh, transgenderism? Well, here's, here's two important things. And, and first, intersex is a very rare condition where a person can have ambigu ambiguous sexual organs. So it could be uh, a male that has smaller male sexual organs or a female that could have larger uh, than normal sexual organs. But in almost every situation of intersexuality, the doctors know whether this is a male or a female. There isn't just, oh, we have no clue whether this person is male or female. In, in, in the vast, vast majority of situations, we know whether this person is a male or female. It's not like there's, there's not a third, so-called third gender of intersex. Not true. But very importantly, when it comes to intersex, that's essentially a biological anomaly. An anomaly is something that doesn't fit into categories. We, there's a, a lot of different anomalies. An anomaly does not nullify categories. Never in medicine or in science, just because there are anomalies, do we then say, we don't know then, you know, we should just get rid of categories. I'll, I'll take, for example, Down syndrome. Down syndrome is when an individual has an extra chromosome. So just because people have an extra, and, and by the way, Down syndrome is way more common than intersex. Way more common. Unfortunately, you, you know why we don't see a lot of Downs kids anymore? I mean, I know when I grew up there, I, I, I knew lots of children that were Downs. You, you know why we don't see those children anymore? We kill them. We kill them in the womb because they don't deserve life. So who's the one that's not for choice? I'm for choice of the unborn. But because Down syndrome people have an extra chromosome, then, then we don't know how many chromosomes humans have. Like, no, there's no situation in science or medicine where just because there are anomalies, we then nullify or get rid of categories. But, so not only that, but Another point that's important is to make distinct when people try to use intersex people to then justify transgenderism because they say, oh, intersex, these are like, these are people that are neither male or female, which is not true. Then they say, so therefore people are transgender. They are neither male or female or they're somewhere in between or they can, you know, change that. They are not seeing the difference. Because intersex, it's like comparing apples with oranges. You can't use an apple to prove an orange. Intersex is an objective phenomenon. It's a biological phenomenon that we can see genetically, we can see anatomically, physically. Transgenderism is not a biological or an objective reality. It's a subjective psychological reality. And that gets to the second category of gender. Tra you know, where intersex is biological and transgenderism is psychological in the same way. Sex is biological and objective. Gender, it's different. Gender used to mean the same thing. Gender and sex used to mean the same thing talking about a man and a woman, male or female, but no longer. Words do change meaning over time. And although we don't see this as a correct category, it still is 
terminology that the world uses, and I think it's we need to be familiar with it so that we can engage with it. If we can't engage with something, we can't engage with false concepts if we don't recognize that this is a false concept. And in general, gender is more difficult to examine. See, unlike sex, gender is a category that exists exists objectively only in the realm of linguistics and language, specifically in highly inflected languages. Nouns and verbs have gender. So if you've ever studied Spanish or French or maybe German, Greek, Hebrew, the majority of languages, um, especially Western languages, are inflected. They're, they are, there are nouns that are masculine and feminine. That doesn't mean like this, you know, specific noun, you know, likes hunting. It just, just words, certain words have gender. That's, that's, that, this has gone on for decades. So if you've ever studied, I mean, I was told that you guys here speak Alabama. Is that, is that right? <laughs> But their different languages are inflected, meaning they have, their words have gender, masculine, and, and because of that, then pronouns match. And it's objective. It's not like, well, what does this chair think? What does this chair feel like today? No. Chairs in Spanish, the word chair, I think it's a feminine noun. Not that all chairs are women. It's just that's language. So all that to say, gender was a category that was an objective category in language and grammar and syntax. Today, gender is now being used to refer to a psychological reality independent from biological sex. So here's a definition. Gender, it's not objective, but it's subjective. And I put in here modern definition. In other words, this is kind of the worldly concept. It's a subjective, not objective, and it's a self-perception, like I feel this, I think this about myself. And it's viewing oneself as being male or female, and in most cases it might line up with your biological sex, but in sometimes it might not line up. At present, this subjective self-perception, this psychological concept of gender is essentially now being f enforced. How? Linguistically. In the, in the guise of call, uh, calling it preferred pronouns, where there's actually no preference about it, it's more mandated. Or newly chosen names that match self-perception rather than objective truth. But isn't this how minds are changed? by changing language first. And given that sex is objective and gender is subjective, you would think that we would value conforming our subjective ideas to objective truth, but instead the opposite is true. Our culture today values altering the objective physical reality of our bodies to now accommodate the subjective impressions of ourselves. I mean, for most people, their concept or self-perception, their subjective view of themselves matches their biological sex. That would be the majority of everyone. But there are some, there are some where that doesn't match. And I want to be clear that in those situations, that's just a reality of the fall. We're all fallen. All, all our thoughts, um, our thoughts and our actions... Um, we have desires in our thoughts that shouldn't be acted on. We have some thoughts and actions that are not good. So that is a reality of the fall. But we're finding more and more today where there are these young kids that claim that they are not the sex that they were born. And so we call this this rapid onset phenomenon, rapid onset gender dysphoria. And, and here's just a, um, something that was written up by someone who had a, did a survey of many parents who had these children. These, some of these were preteens and teens. I'm just going to read what she wrote. 
the onset of gender dysphoria seemed to occur in the context of belonging to a peer group where one, multiple, or even all friends have become gender dysphoric and transgender identified during the same time frame. Parents also report that their children exhibited an increase in social media internet use prior to disclosure of a transgender identity. Recently, clinicians have reported that post-puberty presentations of gender dysphoria in natal females that appear to be rapid in onset is a phenomenon they are seeing more and more in their clinic. Academics have raised questions about the role of social media in the development of gender dysphoria. So this is really almost an epidemic where in some clinics, these um, professionals, mental health professionals, are seeing a rise in preteen girls that sometimes 1,000% increase. Not 100%, not 200%, a 1,000% increase. And that should cause people to scratch their heads because we're not seeing a 1,000% increase among boys who saying they're girls. There's something about girls that women in general tend to be more empathetic. Right? I mean, guys, we're just not. I mean, we can admit to that. That's okay. Women tend to be more empathetic, and we're grateful for that, aren't we? But when you're a child and you're just growing and you're trying to figure out, you want to empathize with people and you want to fit in. And so there's something definitely going on. So I'm not, uh, when I'm talking about, you know, before that there are people that have this feeling, that's usually because in many situations, we're finding that these people that are pre puberty, and they don't go through all that crazy transition hormone and post-puberty suppression, all that craziness. And they don't do that, and they actually go through puberty. In most situations, that rapid onset gender dysphoria is resolved. But in some cases, there are people that in adulthood, they still have that tension. But to be really clear, this is just a reality of the fall. That doesn't mean we need to act on it. We need to claim what it is. It's because of our sin nature that needs to be resisted. Unfortunately, some wrongly then place and choose to make their experience or their self-perception their defining characteristic and then identify as a transgender male to female or female to male, which in essence is elevating psychology over biology. You know, oftentimes we are accused of not believing in science, which belief and science are kind of apples and oranges, but somehow that we don't believe in science, but who is it that doesn't believe in science when we're using our, a person's psychology to erase their biology? Biology is a science, by the way. But this new form of dualism, in other words, mind over body, elevates self-understanding and our perception as the determiner of personhood, like I talked about before, about who we are, hence gender identity. The truth of the matter is we are at best gender or this concept of self at best is not who we are but how we feel. So is then gender or male or female based on you know it you know other things how about culture? You know, does culture or society shape our understanding of male or female? That's what some assert, that, you know, male or female is just based on what culture is. That's what the world is trying to teach us today. That you're only male because the world has told you you're male. Your parents said that you were male because it's assigned at birth. But that is conflating the concept of male or female sex with the concept of norms. When I say norms, I'm talking about masculinity and femininity. Male or female is not the same thing as masculinity and femininity. Masculinity and femininity are behavioral characteristics that are associated with being male or female. These are uh, matters associated with male 
or female. And these admittedly are shaped more by society and more shaped by cultural. For example, uh, in some parts of the United States, masculine is being rough, tough, unemotional, or inartistic. For some, the quintessential all-American man might be a rugged, sometimes loud, bombastic football player or construction worker. Yet taking that ideal of masculine to other parts of the world, like Asia, that wouldn't be masculine. Barbaric, maybe, but not masculine. <laughs> uh, who says that a man can't be artistic? Did you know in the Bible that Jubal was the father of all those who played the lyre and the pipe? Genesis 4. Moses led Israel in a song of victory over Egypt. David was skilled at the harp. And he was a man after God's own heart. He wrote numerous psalms. He also assigned men, men, to be musicians in the temple. Who says men can't be emotional? Right? I mean, I often heard that say, boys don't cry. Who says? The shortest verse in the Bible is, Jesus wept. He's not a man. Ezra, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, many prophets were not afraid to express their emotions through public tears. Strong emotions are not reserved for women only. Amen? Amen. King David was a man known after having a heart after God. He's famous for his brave exploits, first as a shepherd boy, fighting lions and bears to protect his sheep, then as a youth who defied and killed Goliath, and later as a warrior king. But David was also known for being sensitive and intuitive, exhibiting traits that in macho culture would be viewed today as inappropriate for a real man's man. I, I, I sometimes wonder if David grew up today here in the South, playing the harp, <laughs> he would probably be teased as being a sissy. So does that then mean that, that like, there's no difference between how men and women should live? No. Because instead of looking at culture and society and the world, let's look at the Bible. Amen. That's a good place to start. Let's look at the Bible. Because that needs to be our guide. And, and I want to be clear and in, insert this here. You know, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm speaking, I spoke in the morning, speaking here in the afternoon. Don't believe something simply because I say it. Just because Dr. Christopher Yuan said it, don't believe it. Listen, take note, but then go home. And open up the Word of God. Because there, if there is anything that I say that contradicts it, do not believe it. I submit myself fully to the Word of God. It is a light into our path, a lamp into our feet. So I think we always need to look to the Word of God as our guide. Instead of looking for distinctions between man and woman and what that is in, in the world and society and culture, let's look to God's Word. And so this is talking about roles between man and woman, male and female. This is talking about manhood and womanhood and how we live. These are biblical distinctions, distinctions that the world doesn't even they ignore, that we are equal. We're all human. We're all equal in value, but that doesn't mean that we are then the same. See, equal and the same are, we, we can be equal, but not necessarily the same. What does the world want? They want us to be both equal and exactly identical and the same. Whatever a man can do, a woman can do. Whatever a woman can do, a man can do. I'm grateful that there are things that women can do that I can't do. Anyone grateful for that? <laughs> I'm also grateful. I mean, the other way around. We are different. Gloriously, beautifully, wonderfully different. And that's grounded in Scripture. 
In Genesis 2, we have the verse that talks about that um, it's not good for a man to be alone. And then it says that, that um, God made, uh, that, that Adam did not, uh, that Adam needed a helper fit for him. Now this verse oftentimes causes a little bit of controversy, especially among husbands and wives, men and women, because women are always often like, don't call me your helper. But I think that's because we take on this modern definition of what helper means. Helper is like this underling, someone who like works for you, like your maid or your gardener, you know, your help. That's a modern definition of that word. But what does the Bible, when the Bible uses the word help, helper, what does that mean? Well, helper comes from a Hebrew word, etzer, E-Z-E-R. In Hebrew, the Z is kind of like a tz, etzer. It occurs 21 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. 16 of those times, the word helper refers to God. Is God an underling? Is God less than? Is God even incapable? Or is God mighty to save? I'm sure some of you husbands are grateful that your wife saved you out of few situations. Anyone grateful for that? That's a good helper. A helper is someone who is capable, is someone that can help in wonderful, very, very helpful ways strong fit for him a helper fit for him the word fit for him is a hebrew construction connecto that communicates both similarity and dissimilarity adam and eve are both similar in being both human but also dissimilar in being male or female and God actually intends for a woman to compliment a man, not compliment. Compliment is like, ah, oh, you look nice. That's with an I. This is with an E, meaning these are similar but dissimilar. God intends for a woman to compliment, not duplicate a man. And this difference of roles is God's design from the beginning. Going to the New Testament, we have Paul. And he exhorts husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ephesians 5. Wives, submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. We have all this issue today about submission as if submission is bad. Submission is the life of a Christian. These roles are vital in marriage, the church, and in other realms as well. But also in Scripture, we have the first chapter of the Bible that God created the heavens and the earth and filled the earth with animals. The crown of creation was mankind, or Adam. You know the word Adam, the, the name Adam is from the Hebrew word, which means human, or even humanity or humankind. And among all the various characteristics, there's one that is highlighted when it comes to humanity, and that's the image of God. Genesis 1, 27. When we look at this, this conveys um, the, uh, an important connection between being created in the image of God and uh, male or female. So this is Genesis 1.27, and if you look in your Bibles, you'll see how it's all paragraph out, and then when Genesis 1.27 comes in, this is all indented over, which communicates that this is poetry. This is poetry amidst this narrative text. So it's all indented over, and specifically it's three lines. So this is three lines of poetry. And I want to show you this connection that we have that sometimes we miss. We clearly know this is the chapter, uh, the verse on the image of God, and we see that these are three lines of poetry. Anyone ever done sentence diagramming before? Anyone heard of that or did that before in the past? 
So if you'll have a moment uh, just to give, you know, give me a little bit of space here, I'm going to geek out a little bit here with some sentence diagramming. But there's a reason, because I'm going to show you some meaning. So we have the first line, second line, third line. Sentence diagramming is going to show some of this connection. The first line, God created man, subject, verb, object. Then what follows is a prepositional phrase in his own image. Okay, first line is subject, verb, object, prepositional phrase. All right, you got that? Second line, so these are parallel lines, meaning these lines are basically saying the same thing. How do I know that? Second line, instead of beginning with subject, verb, object, it begins with prepositional phrase. In his own image, in the image of God. Basically the same thing, right? And then he created him. That's exactly the same thing that it says above. God created man, he created him. Basically the same thing except it's flipped. Instead of subject, verb, object, prepositional phrase, it's prepositional phrase, subject, verb, object. All right, got that? First and second lines, identical. Third line, instead of a prepositional phrase, we have two nouns, male and female. That, in essence, kind of takes the place of the prepositional phrase in the image of God. And then we have subject, verb, object. He created them. Now, I know that one is him, one is them. This is not talking about preferred pronouns. It is not. I, I, I'm a stickler when it comes to grammar and syntax. So when people try to use they, them to refer to one person, I want to get up my red pen and just kind of <laughs> no, 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 F. For me, that's like taking your nails and just, you know, just, oh, bad grammar. Um, this is referring to, in essence, the second line, he created him, is talking about humanity as a whole, and then he created them, were also individuals. But I want to look at how the second and third line, we have the prepositional phrase, in essence, being replaced with male and female. So as Moses was recording this in poetry, these poetic three lines of poetry, it's actually this undeniable correlation between being created in the image of God and being made male and female. What is that connection? Well, I think a few things. I think here it's, it's talking about humanity being created. And so just as being created in the image of God is essential to being human, being male or female is also essential to being human. Another important thing that we can gather from this is this is not just like a, an aspect of us, but this is referring to the whole person. Not just biology or spiritual or psychological were created in the image of God, but our whole person. Thus, male or female is not just a biological reality. I think we kind of limit what sex is when we only make sex biological. Sometimes Christians make that mistake. We think sex is only biological. No. Actually, sex is first and foremost a spiritual ontological, meaning essential reality that's created by God. Being male or female thus cannot be changed by human hands. Sex is a category of God's handiwork, his original and everlasting design. And as hard as people might try to alter that design made by God, the most they can do is to artificially remove or try to artificial augment body parts or use pharmaceuticals to unnaturally suppress the biological and hormonal reality of one's essence as male or female. The world likes to say that a person transitioned as if it's a one point in time, they did that and now they're male or now they're female. Absolutely not true. Jenner, Bruce Jenner that now goes by Caitlyn Jenner. 
A hundred years from now, if we were to exhume his bones and every scientist in the world, any scientist in the world, would do a DNA test on his bones, he's a man. And that's actually science. So who believes in science? So we see that no matter how hard people try to change things, no one ever actually transitions to anything. They just try to suppress. Do you know that people who transition, so-called, every single day of that person's life, they need to take hormone suppressants and they need to take the opposite sex hormones. You know what we don't hear is how that affects people. Hormones affect people. Ladies, can I get an amen? <laughs> or husband, it's like, oh, amen. <laughs> Hormones affect people. Guess what they affect? One of the um, one things, emotions. Every time that time of month, you know, or, or maybe when you're getting that time where like all those things are shut off, that also affects, I mean, a lot of other things, lots of things. It affects your emotions, which by the way, one of the biggest things that's being swept under the rug is mental health. And instead of dealing with the mental health issues, they're adding gasoline to the fire. Uh, not even estrogen, testosterone. Back when, before I was a Christian, uh, you know, I was living, uh, it's, if you don't know, the, the gay, the, there isn't one lifestyle. I mean, the, the gay community, lesbian community, they have kind of pockets of the way, of pockets of little communities. My friends were not the, you know, the more flamboyant, more feminine. We were, you know, uh, more, you know, tried to be the more masculine or really fit. So I've, you know, it was vanity. You know, it, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to be buff, but I'm Chinese. Uh, you know, I mean, you can't fight your genes. <laughs> I wanted to be buff. And so, you know what I did? I artificially did. Well, during this time um, of, of doing that, are we good now? Are we on? Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, the, that affects your emotions. There's such thing that's called roid rage. I did oh, about two years, cycled on and off, and some of those were testosterone, some of those were other uh, types of steroids. Um, um, I, I told this to, to someone else that was a, a, a young lady, uh, oh, uh, maybe a middle, middle-aged lady. She had quote-unquote transition and taken steroids, testosterone, for years to try to be a man, um, thinking that she would become a man. And, and I told her this story when I tried steroids. Um, I punched through three walls and almost tore a door off its hinge. And I'm Chinese. I told the story to this lady, and she said when she was on a cycle of steroids, she punched through four walls and almost killed her partner. We are ignoring mental health and adding gasoline onto the fire. Um, and then when people say, you know, we are just pausing, um, uh, you know, uh, puberty, 
You can't pause puberty. It either has to occur on its own or it never will again because when you try to pause that, you are going to cause permanent, permanent damage and change. But what is the world saying today? Your psychology, a science, now erases biology, which is also a sci science. So therefore, what I feel has become who I am. But isn't that what we're living today, where our experience rules everything? As I said before, it's no longer sola scriptura, but it's sola ex experien experientia. And what we see today is that transgenderism, this whole talk about transgenderism, the real issue is not what is male or female. The real issue is what is truth. What is real? Because the world says, you feel something, it's your truth. You think something, it's your reality. So I said, it's sola experientia, not sola scriptura. And I said earlier, related in my last talk, we can't understand gender identity or human sexuality without beginning with theological anthropology, that we're all created in God's image. We're also all fallen. So every person has dignity and value. So how do we respond? Well, we need to understand these correct categories, but understand it through God's eyes. We're all created in the image of God, and being male or female is essential to who we are. So I, we must refuse to place our self-perception over bi our biology, and as Christians, we need to refuse that we place neither of those above Scripture, because I am who God made me to be, who makes no mistakes. So who am I? Who did God make me to be? I am created in the image of God. I am a redeemed Christian man, nothing more and nothing less. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Help us, Lord, to live fully for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.